So, spoiler season continues on, and surprise after surprise keeps coming. I mean, Braids is here again. Well, no, not that Braids, not the blue one. Uh, no, no, not not the band one. Uh, but this new Braids, Braids, or is a nightmare? So, find out just how salty this Braids can make your opponents. And speaking of surprises, um, apparently, the ships of Phyrexian? Uh, don't know exactly how or why that happened, but yeah, that's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Let's jump into it. After, of course, you blame Eddie because if I make any mistakes on this episode, it's always Eddie's fault and not mine, and thank you for the help, Eddie. And also, blame Eddie for, uh, the ship being a Phyrexian, and for everything being Phyrexian. Yeah, it's Eddie's fault. Blame Eddie. So, weather light completed. Yes, that's right. The ship is now a Phyrexian as well. A 5-5 legendary artifact vehicle with flying that costs two. It says, as long as weather light completed has four more fine restless counters on it, it's a Phyrexian creature in addition to its other types. And whenever a creature you control dies, put a fire restless counter on it, and then draw a card if it adds seven or more fire restless counters on it, if it doesn't scry one. So there's actually quite a bit going on here, and one funny thing to point out that I was pointed out as well, that's, that's pretty, well, I mean, sad, but funny. Um, this is a vehicle that does not have crew. There is no crew cost, but also, ironically, uh, this vehicle does not have a crew, because... It's just a Phyrexian on its own, just flying around, apparently. Uh, at least that's my assumption. Regardless, no crew or a Phyrexian crew. Anyways, so yeah, unlike your traditional vehicles, you don't actually, you know, tap creatures to actually turn this into a creature. This just either isn't a creature, or eventually it is a creature if you've got enough Phyrexian counters on it, in, it, in which, again, that number is four. So, you can get this down very early again. Two mana for a potential 5-5 five, five flyer, that also is going to be providing you card selection and then eventual card advantage. Because again, let's break down that second part. Again, whenever one of your creatures dies, you get a counter on it. And basically, you're going to be scrying one to start off with every single time that happens. Until you get to seven counters, and then you just get straight up card advantage. You know, on top of this, just being, you know, a 5-5 five, five flyer again for two mana. This provides you an absurd amount of value throughout the game in the right deck. Again, with a lot of card selection and eventual a lot of card advantage as well. So, yeah, there is a ton of value in this two mana mythic. And I can see this being a pretty expensive card because there's certain types of decks out there. Um, aristocrat style decks or, or basically any decks that, you know, deal with sacrificing creatures. But, yeah, mostly aristocrat style decks are going to... Love this. And again, this can fit into every single one of them because it is, you know, a, a not a colorless card, but it is a card that does not have a color. So it can fit in any color identity. So low cost evasion, a uh, decently heavy hitter, plus a lot of card selection advantage. Yeah, uh, a lot of players are going to say, sign me up for that. Now, on this episode, I'm going to talk about some similar cards and some other things to consider with this on top of just giving some examples of some commanders are going to be like, uh, yeah, uh, as long as I can afford the card, I should probably think about including this one in my deck. Now, first up, actually one of the first cards that came to my mind when I saw this is Viscera Seer, but for kind of a different reason. I mean, it's somewhat reminiscent of it. Yeah, Viscera Seer is a 1-1 Vampire Wizard. Or just a black man, it says sacrificing creature, scry one. So this is a very low to the ground creature that again does benefit us, you know, by creatures dying essentially and helping us scry for some card selection. Now, obviously there's a slight difference with this, whereas this one is an actual sacrifice outlet and that's how you get that value. Whereas, you know, the new Phyrexian Weatherlight is essentially just going to benefit based off of creatures dying and it's not an outlet itself and that being said obviously each of them are very low to the ground can work incredibly well together and i'm assuming we're going to see these seeing play in a lot of decks together again viserys here is very very heavily played in aristocrat style strategies that include black so yeah i mean some additional scrying with your phyrexian weatherlight which eventually comes a 5-5 five, five flyer which eventually just draws your cards too that's going to be a lot of fun for a lot of players out there 
Now, next up, some other cards that are somewhat similar. Let's talk about some enchantments with Shadows of the Past, Dark Prophecy, and Moldervine Reclamation. Shadows of the Past says whenever a creature dies, scry one. Now, keep in mind, this not only counts your creatures, but every creature, so obviously there's a difference there. Another difference is obviously this doesn't, well, turn into a vehicle that can hit players for a good amount of damage or eventually give you any, you know, actual card advantage. Yes, card selection is kind of, you know, card advantage in some ways, but you know what I mean, any, you know, actually card draw with this. That being said, obviously there are some similarities. Uh, Dark Prophecy is another one that came to my mind. Whenever a creature control dies, you draw a card and you lose one life. Now, obviously, this one is just strictly card advantage. It's also decently low to the ground, like our new Phyrexian Weatherlight. Uh, this one has cost three instead of two. Obviously, you do need to be in a deck that does include black as well. And of course, on top of that, this is an extremely restrictive mana cost, you know, kind of like the exact opposite of the new Weatherlight. Uh, yeah, uh, you need three black pips to actually cast this. So that is going to be much tougher to include in a lot of decks out there versus the new Weatherlight is like, uh, yeah, basically any Aristocrat style deck is probably going to be like, let's think about that one. And really quick, of course, uh, kind of on the opposite end of Dark Prophecy, we've got Moldervine Reclamation. Whenever a creature control dies, you gain one life and draw a card. So now there's an additional benefit from extra creatures dying. Again, Weatherlight Completed doesn't provide you immediate card advantage like these two do, but eventually it will be giving you card advantage. And yeah, that card selection to start is definitely not nothing. And it can obviously pair very well with either of these to help you, you know, scry first, then draw in the same deck. Now, perhaps some somewhat more comparable cards, though. Let's go to some artifacts with Gate to the Afterlife, and yes, even Skull Clamp. Gate to the Afterlife says, whenever a non-tone creature you control dies, you gain one life, then you may draw a card if you do discard a card. And then it's got some stuff about sacrificing it and going getting Gun Pharaoh's Gift, but ignore that. Anyways, another artifact that can provide you card selection in a way throughout the game. Now, a major difference between this and Weatherlight Completed is that Weatherlight Completed actually doesn't care if it's a token or non-token creature, which is pretty huge, actually, especially for a lot of Aristocrat style strategies out there that might be utilizing a bunch of tokens and sacrificing those for value. Obviously, another difference is that essentially, yes, okay, life gain, whatever. But yeah, but being able to draw, then discard, you know, that's more like looting versus actually scrying. Somewhat similar, again, because you're basically getting more and more card selection, but this one lets you replace dead cards in your hand as well. And of course, obviously, if you've got, you know, ways to take advantage of cards in your graveyard, Gate to the Afterlife can help with that as well. Now, of course, this one is one more mana. Again, it doesn't count token creatures, which is a big difference. And of course, I mean, eventually, uh, Weatherlight Completed is just going to provide just straight up card advantage once you sacrifice enough creatures, or enough creatures die. You know what I mean. Uh, and again, Gate to the Afterlife most likely isn't going to be smacking your opponents for five in the air anytime soon. Now, Skull Clamp is another one that I do want to bring up. Obviously, there's some major differences. I mean, first up, Skull Clamp is an equipment, <laughs> not, not, you know, not a vehicle or, you know, just a regular kind of artifact. It gives Crypt Creature plus one, minus one, whenever Crypt Creature dies, draw two cards. So, another great way to generate, well, an absurd amount of card advantage throughout the game for the right deck. That being said, obviously, you need to pay to equip this to creatures, and those creatures need to die. Now, obviously, this can take out those creatures if they only have one toughness, but still. Yeah, Skull Clank can provide you an absurd amount of card advantage throughout the game, and I'm not saying that, you know, our new Phyrexian Weatherlight is on that level of card advantage. It, it works in a different way, but it also is going to be a consideration for many decks out there that might be depending on something like, you know, a Skull Clamp to actually generate a lot of card advantage and especially for decks that you know might really need a card like skull clamp that don't have a lot of other options you know due to their color identity we'll talk about those here in a bit but yes there are definitely differences between our new phyrexian weatherlight and skull clamp but again both can provide you a ton of value throughout the game in the right deck and in the right build <laughs> Moving on again, I mean, let's say that your goals are to get to, you know, four counters on your Phyrexian Weatherlight and eventually, you know, to get to seven counters. That's quite easy for many decks out there, especially decks that are generating a lot of tokens, like, you know, aristocrat style decks. So a card like Sangir Autocrat, it's a 2-2 human for three and a black. When it enters the battlefield, you get three zero one black surf creature tokens. At least the battlefield do exile them, but yeah, of course, you've got ways to try to sacrifice those again, like the Saraseer, to ensure that you can get every single one of those death triggers. So essentially, this on its own can basically get your Weatherlight active as a creature, and of course, you know, help you scry one four times. Obviously, there are other cards like, you know, Avenger of Zendikar that can make even more tokens. When it enters the battlefield, create a 0-1 plant creature token for each land you control, and obviously can get counters on those plants too. Regardless, this can make an absurd amount of tokens very quickly, 
and, and yeah, this on its own, essentially, again, just assuming that you've got seven lands in play to actually even cast this, you're going to have the amount of creatures that you need in play to ensure that you get enough fine restless counters on whether I completed to obviously, you know, make it into a ship, a 5-5 five five flyer, and then also, of course, you know, go through all that scrying to eventually get to your straight up card advantage. And of course, if you are in green, you've got other ways to make a lot of tokens as well with something like, you know, a Tender Shoot Dryad, which is more of like, you know, an upkeep trigger, essentially. At the beginning of each upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one green sapling creature token. Again, this triggers on every single player's upkeep. So with just two trips around the table, you have made eight tokens. And yeah, there are plenty of ways to sacrifice those tokens, again, with free sacrifice outlets to ensure that you can get to the amount of fire scanners on it that you want. And then just to be generating card advantage throughout the game after that. I mean, even a, like, you know, 25 cent card like Mitotic Slime can get you there basically on its own. A 4-4 that has, when it dies, put two, two, two green ooze creature tokens into play. Then those have, essentially, when they die, put two on one green ooze creature tokens on the battlefield. So essentially, this goes from one creature to two creatures to four creatures. And if you add all that up, that would be seven creatures in total. Again, getting you to your amount of card advantage and value on your weatherlight completed while also, you know, scrying a ton from this in the meantime and turning your ship into a ship that can fly and hit your opponents. Another thing to obviously consider when it comes to, you know, getting counters on something is, of course, there are ways to get even more counters on that more quickly with cards like Tezzeret's Gambit, Evolution Sage, and Flex Chandler, each which deal with proliferating. And Phyrexians love proliferating. Even Phyrexian ships. Anyways, Tezzeret's Gambit says draw two cards and proliferate, and proliferate means that you choose any number of permanents and or players and give each another kind of counter already there. So as long as you've had at least one creature die to get that initial Phyrexian counter on your ship, now you can proliferate to get more. And more and more and more with something like Evolution Sage, which says whenever a land enters battlefield on your control, proliferate. Which, of course, you obviously are in green if you have this, is very easy for you to do for many reasons. I mean, any kind of fetch lands, but yeah, any kind of land ramp in green is generally going to be getting lands into play. Or how about Flux Chandler, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate. So yeah, even outside of having to sacrifice a lot of creatures to get those counters on the ship, of course, there are ways to maybe speed up that process in certain decks, which might also utilize proliferate effects. Or, you know, effects that come on cards like Pure Magic of Rascal and the incredibly and ever-growing expensive card, Doubling Season. Pure says if one or more counters have put on a permanent your team controls, and yes, you're on your own team, that many plus one of each of those kinds of counters are put on that permanent instead. So now whenever a creature dies, instead of just getting one of those counters on that ship, you get two on it instead to make it more quickly into an, well, an actual ship that can hit players, and then also to get to that card advantage. And then, of course, the $80, $90, whatever in the world this card is, if I don't mention it, someone in the comments can be like, well, what about doubling season? Anyways, an effect would create one or more tokens on your control. It creates twice the many of those tokens instead. If an effect would put one or more counters on a permanent you control, it puts twice the many of those counters on it instead. Basically, okay, yeah, I mean, if you're in a Riskrat style deck, let's double up our tokens that we are making so we can sacrifice more of them to get those counters on this ship quicker. And then, of course, we double up the amount of counters that we're getting every single time, too. So, yeah, there's a reason this card is incredibly expensive, works so well with many decks and in many situations. And, yeah, if you really want to get your Phyrexian ship suited up with counters quicker, of course, there are plenty of great ways to do it like these. But now let's quickly jump into some commanders that came to my mind when I thought about commanders who might want to consider this card. And one of the very first ones that came to my mind was Tasa Karlov. Tasa says if a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. And on top of that, for whatever reason, they slapped on creature tokens you control have Vigilance and Lifelink because this commander definitely needed help. Not at all. Anyways, yeah, basically this is the Death Harmonicon commander doubling up every single one of your death triggers. Which, of course, includes your ship, so have fun getting a lot of additional value out of that and getting those counters on that ship much quicker. And, of course, Tasa is one of the most, uh, actually, I think it is the most popular Aristocrat-style commander out there. It's definitely one of the top ones, but yeah. I can see a lot of Aristocrat-style decks out there built around Tasa really wanting this ship. But another Orzhov commander that can also be built in a fantastic aristocrat style way is Alenda the Dusk Rose. Alenda has whenever another creature dies, put a plus one counter on Alenda the Dusk Rose. And when Alenda dies, create X11 white vampire creature tokens with lifelink where X is Alenda's power. So this is a commander that not only benefits from creatures dying, but also gives you a ton of creatures when it dies itself. 
So yeah, get a ton of creatures out, sacrifice those creatures, make this commander massive, and while also getting a ton of fire resist counters and, you know, value out of your ship, then sacrifice your commander and get a ton of tokens, then sacrifice those for an absurd amount of value for your ship. Yeah, things can get pretty out of control with this commander quite quickly, and weather like completed can definitely help with that. Another option is a different kind of Ristograt style commander with Sheree Shizo's Caretaker. Sheree has, whenever a creature with power one or less spinning your grave from the battlefield, you may return that card to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step if Sheree Shizo's Caretaker is still on the battlefield. Basically, all your tiny creatures can die and come back a lot throughout the game with this commander. So there are plenty of ways to already generate a lot of value thanks to this commander, and with this ship, you're like, okay, on top of that, well, okay, I get a 5-5 flyer. Great, I can hit my opponents with that. That's a lot of fun. Uh, but of course, on top of that, uh, let's scry a ton, and then let's eventually just draw a ton. Again, for the low, low mana value of just two, you just have to pay two mana to get that into play. You've got a lot of potential value throughout the game. Or how about another mono black commander like Endric Sar Master Breeder, which can make an absurd amount of tokens very quickly and throughout the game. It says whenever you cast a creature spell, put X 1 1 black throw creature tokens on the battlefield where X of that spell is converted mana cost. And then whenever you control seven or more thralls, sacrifice Endric Sar Master Breeder. Now, this kind of a commander likes to control the amount of thralls typically in play, so yeah, it's going to have plenty of free sacrifice outlets, so. Yeah, you can make thralls very quickly and then sacrifice those thralls and then get your ship up to ship shape. Okay, that was bad. Anyways, a specific kind of deck that can really benefit from a card like this is, well, uh, any mono white deck that can generate a good amount of tokens. Let's talk about Adeline Resplendent Athar. Adeline says, whenever you attack for each opponent, create a 1-1 one -one white human creature token that's tapped and attacking that player or planeswalker they control. Again, in a game of commander, well, you're gonna have three opponents, so you get three of those creature tokens, so you can make a lot of creature tokens very quickly with this. And of course, on curve, that can be quite good. Turn one, play a creature. Turn two, play your ship. Turn three, play this. Then attack with your creature you played on turn one. You get three tokens, great. And then you're you know, basically over half the way to, you know, to the amount of tokens that you want to potentially you know, either sacrifice or have die in some other way so that you can get the amount of counters on your ship to get the most value out of it. And of course, obviously, you know, you also benefit when you're just attacked with that ship with this commander. And yet, like I mentioned, especially in mono white, you are gonna wanna consider this card because well, mono white still does not have a ton of ways to generate a good amount of card advantage or card selections. So this is another great one to consider for decks that again, can make a lot of creature tokens or wanna sacrifice creatures. And, and yeah, this can definitely help out. Speaking of which, another kind of commander that could consider this card is one like Card and Silver Golem, or, you know, Colorless Commanders, because, well, they have an even smaller card pool than monocolored commanders. And of course, again, being a low to the ground way to generate a lot of value throughout the game for a colorless deck, that can be very beneficial. And Karn can interact with the Phyrexian Weatherlight in a very interesting way, actually. Pay one target non-creature artifact is an artifact creature with power and toughness each equal to its casting cost until end of turn. Now, keep in mind that this actually does override the Weatherlight's power and toughness. So instead of, you know, uh, it being, what, a 5-5 five, five flyer, it would be a 2-2 two, two, because, again, it has, you know, two converted mana cost. But still, it would still be a flyer, so you can still get some initial damage in with that, which is quite nice. But yeah, even more so nice is that, you know, if your artifact creatures end up dying, great. You can get counters on, you know, your weatherlight. You can eventually make it into a permanent creature, and you also, you know, get a ton of value out of it throughout the game. But now this episode is coming to a close, it's time for me to give you my final thoughts on weatherlight completed. And of course, my first thought when I saw this card was, oh my goodness, even the ship is Phyrexianized, which I don't know if that's a word or not, but it is now. But yeah, uh, a completed ship is something I definitely did not expect to see. But this card is definitely one that I do expect to see in quite a few aristocrat style decks out there. I mean, again, the amount of potential value this can provide you throughout the game is pretty absurd. And of course, uh, I mean, on top of that, you can get this down very, very early at just two mana. And it can also get thrown your opponents to a 5-5 five, five flyer is a decent, you know, decent hitter. So yeah, I would not be surprised if this is decently expensive, especially since it's a mythic. So um, I don't expect to play it uh, in any of my budget decks anytime soon or if ever, but yeah. Make sure you're staying tuned to this channel for even more exciting quick takes and spoilers. And if you haven't seen my other ones from today, or, you know, I would say yesterday, I guess, but I wasn't working over the weekend or last week, make sure you check those out too. And now I definitely need to go get myself some more coffee. And I'll see you in the next episode. 
And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are. And as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support.